Live. My name is Cindy Speaker. I have with me today Bill Kowalczyk of Michael J. O'Connor and Associates. He's going to talk with us about an interesting topic. It's workers' compensation and the fact that some people are actually afraid to report their work injuries because they fear some type of retaliation. Bill, thanks for being with us today. Well, thank you, Cindy. It's good to see you again. You too. Well, tell me about this. Some people apparently they're injured at work. They have a little bit of fear in reporting that injury because of some type of retaliation or even being fired. What's your experience with that? Uh, Cindy. That's okay. Somebody's calling you. That's, that's live technology. <laughs> can we, can we break this so I can tell them to stop buzzing me? Can we hold on a second? Go ahead and do it live. Cause we're already live. So just go ahead and tell them to stop buzzing. You can do it live. It's okay. We're hold in on real, a second. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> Folks, this is live TV, and this is what happens. So you're seeing that he is, he is getting okay. some. Uh, Tell everybody. Okay. <laughs> that was actually kind of fun. Well, what, what? Now, listen, we have quite a track record because last time, my memory is, we start talking, and my phone, Siri, starts responding to my questions. So <laughs> we had to have something like yes. this happen, right? <laughs> right. I, I have Siri and Alexa at my home now, so I'm apparently living with two women and people thought I was single. Go figure. That's uh, crazy. I know. Let's talk about um, this topic. And okay. uh, so, you know, some of the people who fall into this category, in other words, those who don't report or follow through with a work injury are people that I never get to meet because they never come to an attorney but we right. do find out about this because people do come to us and they come with reservations the reservations involve how does following through with a workers comp claim or even reporting it going to affect my relationship with my employer now they do get the impression from working wherever it is they work that a workers comp claim is not a very welcome thing and a lot of reasons in, are involved in that employers first of all you know don't need an interruption in their production uh, that's caused by a lot of people being out on comp and also workers comp insurance is very expensive the more claims you have the more expensive it gets for the employer often they will make that known okay. to workers so they come and they, they're concerned about whether they're going to ruin their relationship with their employer. Yeah. But what I explained to them is this, um, this act, the Workers' Comp Act, is for you. It okay. was enacted in 1915 with primarily humanitarian purposes involved. Let's not forget that. Now, some employers forget that. Yeah. But the purpose of it is to protect people. Uh, but still, they're afraid. And what are they afraid of? Well, um, theoretically, getting injured could result in losing your job, right. either by attrition, um, layoff, termination, whatever. And there are some, a lot of issues involved in that. Some are workers' comp oriented, some are not. The other thing that we see is that there is this OSHA program whereby they track lost time so lost time injuries any particular company or business under osha's supervision may track and even publicize how many injuries and how much lost time are associated with those injuries and of course as osha is uh, monitoring these situations they're trying to determine what are safe places to work and what are not so safe places to work. Obviously, the not so safe places to work may get more visits by OSHA representatives to determine yeah. why so many people are getting hurt. <laughs> it's disruptive of the business. And if you've ever driven I by a okay. plant, a large plant, a lot of them will have a big sign out front with a number and it says days without injury. So they track it and every day, just like, you know, they change at the uh, gas station the price. Someone yes. is out there going from day 600 to day 601. And 
the message that sends to the public and to the workers who drive past that sign every day to come in is that don't get hurt, stay safe, because right. this is all helping us. Now, that are, is very interesting. Look, can sure. I just interrupt you for a minute? No, oh, sure. Okay, so so you're what you're explaining here, and I've actually seen those signs in places that I've gone over the years. So what they're really saying is they want to make sure there's not too many injury report that their interest is if there's not many injuries reported, OSHA's not as likely to visit them. Correct. But tell us who OSHA is. I mean, I have, are they state or federal? Federal Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Okay. That's who I'm talking about. Now, yeah. when it comes to state workers comp, that organization is not really directly involved. But okay. a report is made to OSHA when somebody is injured, and of course yeah. that becomes a state workers comp matter. But in this instance, in this kind of situation where people are reluctant, this is why I wanted to talk about this issue, because this is one of the reasons they're reluctant. That public sign, yes, or, and they have them inside the plant too, constantly yeah. reminding people not to get hurt has a psychological effect on people that right. maybe, you know, I just let this one slide. People, you know, have a sore yeah. back at work and they just try to work through it. Nobody ever finds out. These, this happens a lot. And the other type of uh, incentive for workers to not be hurt, not be off, actually involves money. So a lot of places, often they're unionized, but not always, yeah. We'll have a safety incentive program whereby if you go so many days or weeks or months without any lost time injuries, yeah. everybody, everybody gets a bonus. So that leads into the other issue that people are concerned about when they get hurt at work. How is this going to affect my relationship with my coworkers? Well, right. if you have one of those financial incentive programs and you get hurt and miss a couple months, you just cost all your buddies a bunch of money. Wow. And that doesn't go over well. So there's right. a lot of pressure to not miss time. And so I've heard these stories and, uh, and I have a speech that I give to my clients and I'll give you the short version, but people will come in. Oh, and, and this is more about hiring an attorney. What if I hire an attorney? Won't that make my employer angry? And I say indignantly that this is America. The Workers' Comp Act is for you. My job is to use that act to protect you. And if nothing else, what was America founded on but the ability to have decent, basic human rights and be able to protect them and enforce them? And that's exactly what we're doing. If somebody gets angry because of that, so be it. But as an American, it's your right. And usually when I give that speech, I'll have some patriotic music uh, playing in the background. That's, <laughs> That's great. It's really great. They love it. They love That's it. That's a great speech. That's a great speech. <laughs> now, what's interesting, Bill, is those the things that you're talking about, I've observed them over the years. But, um, you know, different places I think that I've worked or that I've walked through, the signs and the I've heard of the safety incentives. And I never thought about it from the perspective perspective of somebody that's been injured and now really it's almost like it's been built into you to kind of think, oh no, I don't want to be the one that messes this up for everybody. But it's but, true. But tell us if there is are are can the can the lawyer uh, I'm sorry, can the employer retaliate? Are their fears justified? Well, um Obviously, any employer can violate the law, and that leads yeah. me into a, a, another topic. And, okay. and that is, if you're an injured worker and you're concerned about retaliation, you're concerned about peer pressure, you're concerned about losing your job, what protection do you have? Yeah. You know, have um, employers fired people because they got hurt? Yes. Is that legal? No. But does it happen? Uh, yes, I've seen it. And in all my years of practice, it, it's it's rare to come across actual evidence that that was the case. But many years ago, I was going through a batch of documents sent to me by the employer's attorney. And in there was a memo from one vice president to another saying that in regard to my client's injury, 
we need to take the bull by the horns and get rid of this guy before it becomes a long-term compensation program. Wow. And that was direct evidence of an illegal termination. So obviously that led to a good result for my client. But this is what I'm talking about. Right. Rarely do you see that. It's usually a lot more subtle, a lot more covert. So if someone gets injured at work, uh, they may not, it may not re- lead to a direct termination. But what I can say, and what often happens is, if that person comes back to work at some point, light duty or full duty, we do notice, and we've heard many stories, that they are now treated differently. Wow, yeah. So sometimes that different treatment will rise to the level of discrimination, harassment, or a violation of law. So there are lots of things that protect injured workers in this regard, and in both the state and the federal level, and one of the more prominent ones is the Americans with Disabilities Act. So, you know, 15 years ago, this act was enacted to make sure all workers had uh, protection of any disability, either work-related or not work-related, and access to the workplace, and there were a lot of things. So, if, in fact, it can be determined that somebody was either terminated or discriminated against because of a work-related disability, that could invoke the Americans with Disabilities Act, and that okay. could invoke a federal lawsuit. We don't right. do that work, but we refer people out for that type of thing. Okay. And one of the most common things in workers' compensation in regard to that federal law is what is called a reasonable accommodation. So after somebody develops a disability, a company which is subject to the ADA, and not every company is, you have to have at least 50 workers and there's some other requirements, but regardless, if you are under the protection of that act, you have to be able to make a reasonable accommodation. So that means if you have a light duty job that fits the um, restrictions of an injured worker, you're required to offer it to them. Okay. And, And this also, you know, is something that involves state law as well, because if you can do that, it can change the nature of the workers' comp claim as well. Okay. But I would say to anybody, after you've been injured, if you feel that after you are injured, you are discriminated against in any way, if you are terminated unjustly, that you should seek um, redress under either state, anti-discrimination laws, Human Relations uh, Commission of Pennsylvania, or federal law. Now, in Pennsylvania, we are employees at will. Keep that in mind that anybody can be terminated for no reason. I mean, you could be laid off from your job for no reason unless you have a contract. What you can't be is fired for a reason that implicates a right that you have, be it a civil right, like your race, your religion, be it a disability, also illegal. So, in those yeah. instances, we refer people out to lawyers okay. who are employment lawyers, and they yeah. sometimes will sue uh, if someone has been wronged. Right. Now, one of the things that occurs to me when I think about uh, fallout from yeah. work injuries is uh, unions. Yes. Now, unions, unfortunately, unions used to rule Pennsylvania from Philadelphia to Pittsburgh and all places in between. Almost every heavy industry and even service industries were unionized. That's not so much the case anymore. So most of my clients are not in a union, are not subject to a collective bargaining agreement. Okay. And this is how it affects this type of thing. If you if you are um, an injured worker um, and you have a union behind you, it's a lot easier yeah. to assert and protect your rights. And okay. I can go into more yeah. detail about that, and I'd like to. But uh, unfortunately, most people don't have that protection in right. Pennsylvania. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Bill, what if, if, if someone cannot return to work, how long are they going to be able to collect workers' compensation? Does that end at a certain time, or how does that work? Uh, well, Before we get into that, let me talk a little bit about labor unions. Oh, okay. Okay? 
Now, labor unions uh, affect the workers' compensation process in a number of different ways. And this is something that occurs to me when I think about the differing clients that I have. So the first thing that I notice is that there's a better support system. For instance, you may have a union steward, uh, uh, trustees, a uh, vice president, a president, who are constantly educating their members about what to do in terms of getting injured and what your rights are. A lot of companies don't follow the law in regard to the procedure about uh, workers' comp injuries. For instance, they may not provide a list of physicians that you can treat with called the panel. In right. most union shops, the union officials make sure that's properly posted so that everybody's informed about what they have can and cannot do. The other thing, the one great benefit of a union shop is that a lot of workers, when they get hurt, they go off of work. Now, their job is not assured and their job may go away. The company may just replace them. They may lose their health insurance, which is also a big thing. They need to keep working to get that health insurance and right. now they can't work because of their injury. Yeah. However, if you're a union worker, usually your collective bargaining agreement provides that they're going to hold your job open for a period of time. And some strong unions have been able to um, negotiate up to two years. And usually during that period of time, the individual keeps his health insurance. Okay. Which often, you know, that affects his whole family. Yeah. And he's or she is in a much different position than someone who, after 90 days, loses all that. And yeah. sometimes that happens. Okay. Union workers also have certain uh, rights that ununionized people do not. For instance, a lot of these issues that would normally be considered maybe an unfair labor practice that employers do to workers apply to workers' comp cases. So they have yeah. the right to grieve it. They have the right to file a grievance, have a hearing over that issue which ultimately could help them in regard to their position in the workers' comp case. Now, there's also case law in Pennsylvania that puts union workers on a different level than other workers in regard to one type of action. And that is the type of action where the insurance carrier is trying to reduce or stop the benefits of the injured worker based upon available work outside of their usual employment. Now, okay. if you're not in a union, any type of work that is vocationally and physically appropriate could be found to be uh, available to you and could thusly result in the reduction of your benefits. Okay. However, if you're in the union, you can defend that action by showing that working in that non-union job that they're trying to show is available to you would interfere with or cause you to lose some union rights and benefits. So that's something we invoke every time we have a union worker in that situation. Excellent, excellent. So, and then you wanna go back to the, if, you, if someone is, uh, cannot return to work, how well, long will they collect workers' compensation? Right, and that's an interesting question because we get it a lot. Okay. Because there's a lot of misconception. And it's funny, too, because and uh, I get a lot of people telling me that they believe or they've heard certain things about workers' comp law. In other words, how long it'll last, how much you can get, and all this. And often it's misinformation because they're getting it from people who don't know or who speculate or who have access to the Internet. Whatever, yeah. but I always say to people, if you really want to know, make sure you're asking a workers' comp attorney. Yeah. So in this instance, when people ask me, okay, so how long will I be on comp if, um, if I just can't go back to work? Because usually people's initial uh, thought is, I'm hurt, I'll get better, and I'll go back to work. And usually that's in their best interest to do that. Sure. However, the reason I exist and the reason attorneys like me exist is because a lot of people can't go back to work. So now what do you do? Well, you have to protect your income, and that's what we do. So what I say to them initially is, how long are you going to be on comp? Well, I don't know, because every case is different. 
Could you be in, on comp indefinitely? Theoretically, yes. <laughs> now, okay. I say theoretically because yeah. there are a lot of caveats there. But yes, I have had individuals who've been on comp for 15 or 20 years. Wow. Okay. Some of them, some of them retire on comp. However, oh. the law has evolved over the years to favor insurance companies such that that doesn't really happen anymore. Most cases settle before that because there are things that are available to employers and their insurance companies to get people off comp. And there's a myriad of things and I can't go, I don't have time to go into all of them now, yeah. but trust me, between, you know, having an independent medical exam, a, a comp, an insurance company doctor examine you, an impairment rating evaluation after two years that yeah. rates you in percentage of whole body impairment, utilization reviews, which can challenge any medical bill, offering light duty work. There are a lot of things that companies can do to keep these benefits uh, uh confined to a certain period of time yeah because like we've said before they don't they don't want to pay them indefinitely it's right. hugely expensive it's hugely expensive right everything you're everything you're saying here just says to me i mean you you almost have to have you have to have someone on your side and i think that's where you come in and and the types of things that you do um for these people because i don't know how you could navigate this alone like you talk about utilization, you know, reviews and ratings and all these things. And it's like, you know, it sounds like you can have an impact in those types of things. I doubt that the person fighting the insurance company alone would have that kind of success. True. And uh, just generally, it makes sense to retain counsel in yeah. these matters because of the nature of our fee agreement. It's contingent. So right. I, I do a lot of work for free. Sometimes I don't get paid for a year or two, and then maybe the case will eventually settle. But without yeah. that advice of counsel, the case may not have gone the same way. I mean, people will go back to work when they don't have to or shouldn't, yeah. and they're forced into things that they don't know because they don't have counsel on their side. So I recommend everybody uh, immediately get counsel. Yeah. And, you know, I, as I was saying, the, the workers' comp law has evolved to the point where it's becoming more complicated every day. Yeah. And so not only do you need an attorney, you need somebody who is a specialist. And I think about the way the law is now as compared to when I started in, you know, 1985. And back then it was a little more simple, but you know, 10 or 11 years later, there was uh, an amendment. And then a little a few years later, there was another amendment and everything has changed. So, it really takes a specialist to navigate yeah. that. Bill, how many of these cases go to court? Well, see, that's an interesting uh, question, and a lot of people don't always understand how this works. Workers' compensation is an administrative system. It is a um, program that provides benefits to people. Now, if they get hurt and the employer accepts it, recognizes the injury legally and begins paying them and paying their medical bills, there is no court involved at that point. Okay. Now, I, I still tell people you need an attorney at that point sure. just to help you along the way make the decisions. And those decisions right. could be crucial about where your case eventually ends up. Yeah. So a lot of people get the comp and they're not in court. They're just getting a check in the mail and that's fine. But many cases do go to court eventually, and there are a lot of reasons that they would go. So for instance, just because you're getting comp doesn't mean it's going to be uninterrupted. Doesn't mean it's not going to be challenged. And that challenge could come from the insurance company that insures your employer. And there's a number of things they can do to challenge it. So at that point, it's going to be assigned to a judge. You're going to need an attorney. And you know, the other thing is, in workers' compensation, we can settle cases, but of course the cases that settle are the ones where an individual truly is not able to resume employment at that employer and both parties want to break ties. So the individual yeah. is going to end up resigning. And if that's the case, the attorney can negotiate a settlement or a lump sum. And I, I really have to 
stress to people when I talk to them about this, it's not a traditional settlement. If I get hit by a bus tomorrow, that case is eventually going to settle or it's going to go to trial where I get a verdict. If that bus driver was negligent, it's going to happen. And that right. settlement will include pain and suffering, uh, loss of life's conveniences, medical bills, wage loss, um, <clears throat> all these things that affect your life. You can even get money for your spouse, but not in workers' comp. So when we talk about settlement, we're not talking about it in the traditional sense in civil law, in negligence law. Workers' compensation is a no-fault system. There's no negligence involved. So when I say settlement, what I mean is at some point, you've been on comp for so long, you've cost this insurance company so much that they want to get you off comp and close the file. They're willing to pay you for the privilege to do that. So then if your attorney can negotiate such a thing, it must be approved by a judge. So again, in those instances, we find ourselves before a judge who will approve the settlement. Now that's non-confrontational, non-adversarial. It's okay. just a formality. But I again, see. the court plays a part in that along with every other petition that can be filed by both insurance carriers and by your attorney. That's why, you know, at the beginning of the case, there are things that need to be filed sometimes. They may accept your claim, but maybe they're not paying you the right amount. Yeah. Maybe they're not paying all your medical bills. Maybe they're telling you to go to a doctor that you don't need to go to. Many, many things that we can get involved with and help these people from yeah. the start, Cindy. I can see that. This is a wealth of information. A lot of great details here. Bill, how can they reach you if they have specific questions? Um, they can call us. Our main office is in Frackville, Pennsylvania, and it's 1-800-518-4LAW. That's 518 518- for law. You can find us on the web, www.connorlaw.com as well. Okay, very good. Bill, thanks for your time today. All right. Good to see you and I hope to talk to you again soon. Okay. And to those of you watching, if you have additional questions, post them in the comments. We'll get back to you and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks so much. Bye, Cindy.